Okay, we are officially live. Uh, it is so great to see all of you this evening. Welcome back to the Black Freedom Lectures. And my name is Eve Ewing. I am the curator of the Black Freedom Lectures. Um, and it's wonderful to see some new faces and some old faces. Thank you for being here. Um, just gonna double check and make sure that we are all live and good to go. There we go, all right, great. Uh, I am coming to you live from the city currently known as Chicago, which is the occupied lands of the people of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa nations, as well as the Miami, the Menominee, and the Ho-Chunk nations. Um, if you missed it and you're interested in learning more about Black and Indigenous histories and solidarities, the ways that our histories uh, intertwine and overlap, please check out a previous lecture on our channel where you can learn more about that from Dr. Elena E. Roberts. Um, I have some really cool things to announce that are coming up. Tomorrow we have a new lecture that is dropping and it is going to be the amazing Barbara Ransby who will be talking about black Marxism, internationalism and anti-fascism. White people did not invent anti-fascism. So if you wanna know about black people and our anti-fascism, please come through to that conversation. That'll be live tomorrow evening right here on our YouTube channel. And also, normally our Q&As are on Thursdays like this one, um, but we have a very special event coming on Monday. So given the, the urgent situation that is happening in Palestine right now, Karee Peterson Smith has graciously agreed to join us um, for a conversation about Black and Palestinian freedom struggles. I am really looking forward to learning a lot. Please come through, bring a friend, bring a question or two. Um, that will be 6 p.m. Central Time, Monday, May 17th. If you're like, wow, Eve, you just said so many times and dates, I can't keep track of this, I relate. But it's not a problem because you can keep up with all of our conversations if you sign up for our newsletter at blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter. That is blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter. And you will get a rundown of who's speaking and what you should read and how to learn more. We also do a free book giveaway every week. So please sign up for our newsletter and get all of that. Follow us on all the socials. Okay, so now for this evening's conversation, I want to say thanks as always to our wonderful team, Imani Legron and Sianda Mohutsiwa, as well as our ASL interpreter, Barbara Williams Finley, and our friends and colleagues at the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, as well as the Mellon Foundation. And tonight, I am thrilled to introduce our two special guests. Allison S. Reed will be our discussant this evening. Allison is a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of Chicago. And Allison's research asks how health, disability, safety, and well being shape political life and action. And this research operates from a Black and disabled feminist framework. If you want to learn more about Black disability studies, we have a lecture on that coming up too with Moya Bailey hollering at us, inflected by a queer of color, by queer of color thought. Allison's previous work on urban social innovation and current project on the body and activism and overarching research program are all united by a really important question, especially among the socially and politically vulnerable, what does just flourishing look like? A question we should all ask ourselves every day. And Allison will be in conversation. You can see why they are the perfect person to talk tonight with our special guest, Professor Dorothy Roberts, who I am, uh, I will always take the opportunity to say is a personal hero of mine and a role model and an influence of mine. So I'm really grateful that you agreed to join us. Professor Roberts is a widely acclaimed scholar of race, gender, and the law, who is on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania with joint appointments in the Department of Africana Studies and Sociology and the Law School, where she holds the inaugural Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mosell Alexander Chair. She's also the founding director of the Penn Program on Race, Science, and Society in the Center for Africana Studies. And her pathbreaking work in law and public policy focuses on urgent contemporary issues in health, social justice, and bioethics, especially as they impact the lives of women, children, and African Americans. Her major books include one that you can't miss if you ever take any of my classes, that's Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, Shattered Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare, and Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty. She's the author of more than 100 scholarly articles and book chapters, as well as the co-editor of six books on such topics as constitutional law, and women in the law. And she serves on the board of directors of the American Academy of Political and Social Science and has received many well-earned and well-deserved honors, 
including election to the National Academy of Medicine, the Society of Family Planning 2016 Lifetime Achievement Award, and the American Psychiatric Association 2015 Solomon Carter Fuller Award. We are so deeply grateful that you both would bless us with your presence this evening. If you did not already see Dr. Roberts' lecture that dropped this past Friday on racism and medicine, um, you can catch it on our YouTube channel after this is over. And as always, we really encourage folks to please post any questions that you may have in the chat and we'll be happy to share them. With that, I will happily turn it over to our two special guests. Thank you. Thanks, Eve. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Ewing. And thank you so much for being here today, Professor Roberts. Um, as I'm seeing from my questions and a lot of the questions that are being proposed, um, you know, there's so many uh, massive health upheavals and transitions and developments happening at the moment alongside um, and within um, so many great um, as in large racial uh, upheavals, especially um, very visible um, and globally resonant killings of black bodies themselves. Um, so given that this is the moment that we're living in, of course, those things are always at play. Um, but given that they are so visible and, um, you know, not something that one can easily um, passively escape, um, I can't think of anyone better, you know, to be here um, as we, as we quote unquote, go back to normal on this day where vaccinated folks are allowed to go without masks, right? So it's all, all back to normal. What does that really mean? Um, and I think your work um, helps us to contextualize and trouble that notion of normal. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and, and with that, again, um, I have a few questions prepared um, that have a certain arc, but I definitely want to make room and space um, for many of the questions posed here, um, some of which um, kind of correspond um, to some of the questions that I have. And so I'll, I'll find ways to layer those in with the pre-prepared questions, hopefully um, getting to, to what folks have already brought up in the, in the 50 minutes that we have together. Uh, so does, does that sound okay? <laughs> sounds wonderful. And thank you so much for discussing these topics with me. And thanks also to Professor Ewing for bringing us together. Absolutely, yes, thank you again. And so I'd like to begin, um, as Professor Ewing um, illustrated with her, her introduction, of course, your career has so much depth and breadth, it's hard to find uh, one place to start. Um, but the place I did want to start um, that you often go back to uh, was the moment when you, you started witnessing more and more uh, Black mothers being prosecuted um, uh, for having, for having used crack, um, during pregnancy and the, and the complex prosecutorial issues that came up with that. And I know you, you mentioned that catalyzed your, your landmark book, Killing the Black Body. So I was just hoping you could kind of take us back to that moment. What, you know, what shifted in you and how did that launch into the book project that we know? Yeah, sure. Well, you're right that I do frequently go back to that period when I first started teaching in 1988 at Rutgers Law School in Newark, which was a site of lots of prosecutions and also mainly removals of babies from their mothers, Black babies from their mothers. They were called border babies at the time because there were so many of them being kept at hospitals and I, I go back to it frequently because it represents so deeply the devaluation of Black women, the control of Black women's bodies, the way in which Black women are at the center of so many intersecting forms of oppression and, and policies that are punitive uh, and dehumanizing. Uh, policies we can trace all the way back to the enslavement of Black people, and then bringing it all the way to today, where we continue to see these 
kinds of violations of Black women's bodies that can make really oppressive and inhumane policies seem normal, to go back to what you were saying at the beginning. So uh, I'll take you back to 1988. I was just beginning as a professor and I had been practicing law in Manhattan and, re and reading about these arrests and prosecutions of women for using drugs while pregnant. And first of all, I thought, what a brutal policy to arrest pregnant people, you know, new mothers, because they have a health problem. And the other thing that struck me was this must be Black women this is happening to. I, I couldn't imagine police marching into the maternity ward, you know, in a fancy hospital where white women were being, uh, giving birth and dragging them out, you know, in handcuffs and leg shackles to jail, which was what was happening to black women. And so I, I started to look into who were these women who were being prosecuted and it turned out that the vast majority of them were black women who had smoked crack cocaine while pregnant. And it seemed to me, number one, that they were being punished for having children. So this wasn't the way it was being portrayed in the media, it was being portrayed as these were horrible monsters of mothers who were transferring to their children this kind of, it, it was worse than physical harm. It, it was supposedly that they were producing these crack babies, so-called crack babies that were going to be completely incapable of functioning in society. In fact, some of the claims even made by doctors were that they would lack social consciousness, that they wouldn't be able to learn, that they would become criminals. And so it was very clear to me that the way in which this public health problem was turned into a crime had everything to do with the fact that these were black mothers who were being prosecuted and that it was a combination of the war on crack cocaine that was going on at the time, but also a long lasting history of devaluing black women's bodies and childbearing. And so I, I wanted to document that this was happening to black women, but I also wanted to change the way in which the public debate was being presented as if this were a question of protecting, you know, innocent unborn children from their monstrous mothers when in fact we were living in an America that has never protected black children. So that was a fake excuse for punishing black women. And I also wanted to make it clear that this not only was not about protection of black children, but it was, had everything to do with punishing their mothers for having children in the first place uh, and that you could not understand either the criminal policy or the reproductive health policy without attending to the way in which racism and sexism were intersecting in these policies. So I, I, I wanted to do a lot, <laughs> but you see that, that those prosecutions really were a, a way if you if you delve into them and and really think about how could you get to prosecuting someone for a health problem it was it, it showed the devaluation of black mothers and it showed the really puny, approach to reproductive rights that was going on in the United States at the time. At the time, reproductive rights only meant freedom from state interference in terminating a pregnancy. People weren't thinking about most, the mainstream organizations, I should say, were not thinking about the ways in which sterilization abuse was a form of reproductive violation. 
you know, the way in which welfare policies that try to deter people from having children while on welfare, you know, were a form of reproductive injustice. All of these ways that Black women's decisions and bodies had been violated uh, had not been at the forefront of the mainstream reproductive rights organizing. And so I, I wanted to intervene in that as well. And it happened that at the time I was writing Killing the Black Body, there was this emerging reproductive justice movement, which had long roots among Black women, but it was becoming more vocal. Uh, Black women had coined the term reproductive justice. And so that work I was doing was able to be part of this new growing movement for reproductive justice. And, and then as I began to advocate against the prosecutions, I wrote an article in 1991 that argued they were unconstitutional because they violated Black women's privacy and equal protection rights. And then I began to think about all the policies and the long history of violating Black women's reproductive decisions and lives and beings and how that had been part of racial oppression and white supremacy from the time of enslavement until the policies that were be being debated at that moment. You know, while I was working on this, it was the time when welfare, the the federal guarantee to welfare was being abolished. Uh, it was the time where the, the idea of the black welfare queen was being promoted. Uh, it was still a time when there was sterilization, coerced sterilization of black women. Uh, and I could go on with the poli policies. I It occurred to me that my goodness, there are this host of policies that are all directed at painting black women as if we are the problems for ourselves, for our families, for, for the nation, and that we should be the subject of regulation, uh, that it was appropriate to make decisions for us about our bodies, uh, even to torture us and deny us the ability to have children and then to blame black women for what was actually the result of structural racism. You know, blaming black mothers for harms to their children that resulted from white supremacy and racial capitalism. And so as I thought about this, I thought this is I need to write a book about this. And that's, that's how Killing the Black Body came about. Absolutely. Wow, thank you. Just taking notes for so rich, <clears throat> and of course, such a rich book, so many possible ways from the health organizing, reproductive justice, um, and everything that you just articulated. Um, there's so many analytical questions. Um, and I also, maybe, because the other, the other thing that wells up is, you know, how, how did you hold all of that, right? Mm -hmm. Standing at this intersection, as I was thinking of this question before, it's like, okay, as you know, standing in, having been a practitioner of law and a professor of the law, and also being a sociologist, so a social scientist who works with law, a lawyer and law professor who works with social science, mm -hmm. um, how does one navigate that? Not just substantively, you know, that we know sociology and law are both concerned with race, but methodologically, mm -hmm. theoretically, ethically. But you've also brought in, of course, the, the political element, the policy element. You know, you're doing this added labor, right? You know, that's not just, oh, I'm just going to kind of do a kind of standard sociological tome and, and ship it out. Like you, as you said, that's a, there's, there's a lot of work going on. And I'm just curious how, um, and I realize this is a little bit meta, but what what is it meant to hold all those hold all of that all these years and do it with integrity? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I feel that you can't really understand 
these policies and politics without taking into account all of these dimensions of it. Uh, these are all legal issues. So the question of whether it should be legal to prosecute somebody for harm to a fetus is it's a legal question. It's a constitutional question. But the thing is, you, you can't understand why there would be a policy that implements punishing someone criminally for their behavior while pregnant and why it would be upheld by the law if you don't take into account the historical devaluation of Black women's childbearing and the various ways that the state has tried to control our decisions about our bodies. And you also can't understand it if you don't take into account the ways in which punishing Black women and portraying Black women as harmful to their children has supported not only punishing us, but shoring up institutions like, you know, in prisons and foster care and behavior modification in social service programs and welfare programs, all of those are buttressed by these myths about Black mothers. So how, how could you understand why a prosecutor, you know, would decide to bring charges against a woman who used drugs while pregnant? Why, why would that even be a crime? The only way to explain it is to bring in these other dimensions. And if you don't bring them in, you it's going to seem as if this is just a simple legal question, but there are no simple legal questions. This is one of the problems with the way in which the law was analyzed and legal scholarship was conducted in the past, largely before cr critical race theory came about, which was that you could just look at legal decisions and analyze you know, the next legal decision by the precedent of the past legal decisions as if there, there was just, these are just neutral decisions that advanced in the law you know, without any regard to politics or social inequality or social hierarchies. And, that simply allows injustice to continue without being examined. And so I guess, I guess I just felt early on that that kind of legal analysis was not only inadequate, it really obscured structural injustices. I, I guess a, a lot of my work I think is trying to bring in these multiple dimensions of forms of legal injustice and kind of by bringing it all together, pulling off the veneer of legality and justice and neutrality, you know, and show the politics that's actually going on that is what fuels these decisions and policies. Um, I feel like that's what I'm doing now in my work on, which I talked about in my lecture, mostly on uh, racism in medicine, where again, you know, before I was talking about the law, but if we look at medicine, it's very similar. The, uh, and I don't mean to jump ahead of questions you might have been meaning to ask, but, but it's very similar that in medicine, there's the idea of this progression uh, and advancing of medicine uh, to, ensure greater and greater health of, you know, for everybody when in fact medicine has been held back by these antiquated racist ideas about differences, natural differences between the bodies of people of different races, all of which was invented right, to justify enslaving African people and exterminating indigenous people and taking their land. And 
without knowing that history and then analyzing how that history gets perpetuated and reproduced over generations, you can't really understand why there continue to be these stark health inequities, despite the fact that doctors and biomedical researchers are claiming to be addressing them when, when actually they are still basing the way they practice medicine and conduct their research on fundamental ideas that are racist and white supremacist. If you don't bring that to the fore and expose it, we will just continue to have the same kinds of racial injustices and inequities that we've seen for 400 years in America. And I guess I, I see my work as helping to give some support you know, for people who are organizing, who I don't, I don't wanna make it sound like I've exposed something that no one else realized before. I think people who are enduring the conditions that I'm writing about absolutely know that these are not just conditions. You know, they know that the law isn't neutral. They know that there, this, there isn't this steady pro progress, you know, in medicine or law or any other aspect of US life and, and exploration. Uh, and so I, I find it really, I guess, fulfilling and hopefully helpful <laughs> to be able to do these kinds of analyses that help to expose the injustice that ordinary people know, you know, black people know uh, is going on and have been rebelling against and organizing against. And so uh, killing the black body, for example, I, I was just trying to explain, you know, the history and the politics that I saw behind all these policies that were punishing and violating black women so I could be useful to people who were organizing in the reproductive justice movement. And, and my hope is that that book has been useful for that. Uh, and that it's also brought some people to greater understanding of how these policies operate so that more will join a movement to dismantle, abolish, and reimagine what it would mean to have true reproductive justice. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. And I think it's really telling, you know, the ways that you talk about the sort of synergy with the movement. Because I think sometimes like academia and the movement get pitted against each other. And I see that less with black and brown women and femmes, where it's more like how, how, how are we co-conspirators in the project of liberation? Um, so thank you for kind of giving us a model for what that that could look like. And I also I appreciate you jumping ahead because I think you know the science and the health is always relevant. And you know today, today is a triumph of the vaccine day. So I wanna I wanna bring it. Somebody posed a, a wonderful question about the vaccine, and and I have a related one. So I think I think it's it's a as I was going over my notes, I think I was like going over um, your chapter on the contraceptive vaccine, like right after the press con concept, you know, so some interest in cognitive dissonance happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of our, our um, you know, folks posing a great question. Um, during the early rollout of the vaccine, there seemed to be a media obsession with the idea of black vaccine hesitancy and all these discussions about how it was related to Tuskegee. And now it turns out the greatest vaccine hesitancy is among white Americans. What do you think happened there? And how did we get that story wrong? Yeah, well, there has always been this confusion between Black people's skepticism based on their, not only a history 
of exploitation and experimentation and abuse by the medical profession of Black people. But current day, you know, continuing exploitation and experimentation and abuse and disregard and neglect, you know, of Black people by the medical profession on the one hand, and a confusion of that with the idea that Black people are afraid of science or Black people have irrational disregard for science or Black people are incapable of understanding science or Black people are uh, just resistant to following you know, their doctor's orders or following public health policies. And the latter has been an excuse for blaming Black people for our own, you know, poorer health that actually stems from structural conditions that bombard us with unhealthy conditions, right? So um, it has that, that idea that Black people are somehow antagonistic to science and medicine um, I, I think is, is just so embedded in public health policies that it comes to the fore when uh, you see an unequal access, Black people get blamed for it as if it's something in our culture or in our you know, superstitions. And I think that's why. Another thing that happened when it became clear that Black people were dying from COVID at much higher rates than white people was an immediate response that was even published in peer-reviewed journals that maybe there was some unknown genetic predisposition that Black people had. And so these ideas that there's something, and, and this relates to what I was saying about the idea that black women pass on, you know, a depraved lifestyle or harms to their children, almost as if it's some innate predisposition black women have. There's also this idea that black people have innate predispositions to poor health and a cultural predisposition to superstition and fear of Rational, rationality in general, you know, and, and, and science in particular. And again, these ideas, we could trace all the way back to slavery and they get reproduced over and over and over. It's common for doctors to state that black people won't comply, you know, with their medical instructions and prescriptions when the problem has to do with barriers to being able to follow instructions, or sometimes the instructions aren't good instructions. You know, so um, I think that that initial response had to do with finding an excuse in in some innate predisposition of Black people for what is actually the consequence of structural racism. You know, you may know this, this goes through everything I've been saying <laughs> this, this evening. It's because it's such a common pattern in anything having to do with black people's health is to blame us for what are the consequences of racial capitalism and white supremacy uh, and, and structural racism. So that's why I think there was this immediate response. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't Black people who are hesitant, but what I'm saying is it's not an irrational response. And it's not, you know, in some ways you could say Black people have more reason to be hesitant about a government rollout of a vaccine than white people do. And yet, we are not any more hesitant, uh, or I would say it's a skepticism. It's a healthy skepticism to want to make sure that the government's actions aren't being, aren't harmful to black people, um, based again on a long and continuing history. But in fact, 
we equally have to be concerned about the lack of access to the vaccine for Black people who want to be vaccinated. Uh, that should be as much a concern as Black people who are reluctant to get the vaccine. And both of those have to do with longstanding structural problems with healthcare uh, as it applies to, to Black Americans. So uh, that, that's, that I think explains, you know, these strange ways in which the media have had to flip flop about what actually is going on. And as more evidence comes forth, have to acknowledge that black people aren't any more reluctant than white people are, and that there are black Americans who are being prevented from getting the vaccine, although they want it, because of these structural barriers. Thank you. Thank you, you know, as we said at the beginning for helping us situate so many of the questions, maybe that, you know, we were in survival mode, it was hard to look at critically. It's very helpful to have, a, you know, a voice to help us do that. And there's just something, because like you said, and, and this is a question that's coming up about the threads that run across your work. It almost feels like it's not possible to jump too forward or too far behind because they all connect. Um, but you, you mentioned like em embodied predispositions. Um, I think earlier you mentioned this notion of monstrosity and, yeah. and, we, and we've touched on COVID and, and it's also, it feels impossible to talk about the murder of black folks at the hands of the state, at the hands of the police. And when we think about the trial of George Floyd's murderer, how the defense kept trying to somehow locate the cause of his murder in his body, you know, the monstrous black body. So how, how can we situate your work in this current, you know, moment where we're questioning carceral logics and thinking through abolition and um, related issues? Yeah, well, one way of situating it is that my work tries to show how these ideas of innate Black irrationality, violence, depravity have affected policies and institutions in the United States that are aimed at containing Black people. So, you know, th this is what the invention of race did. I mean, we could go all the way back fundamentally to that. It was the invention of the idea that some natural force divided all human beings into races and white people were at the top, the superior ones, and black people were at the bottom. And that black people had innate traits that made them suitable to be enslaved and that disqualified them from freedom and liberty and autonomy, whereas white people had the opposite kinds of innate traits. And, you know, it, it's not popular anymore to explicitly say that, or, you know, of course there are avowed white supremacists and nationals would say that, but, you know, liberal Americans won't come out and say that, uh, but so many aspects of policies that they support are founded on that basic idea. And there's a lot of research going on today that is resuscitating these ideas of genetic difference between black people and all other human beings, especially white people. And it, 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 is a continuation of this basic message that whatever violence and oppression and inequality Black people are enduring and surviving and, and being, you know, even being killed, murdered by in the US comes from something innate in Black people. You know, so just in the same way that during the slavery era, 
Samuel Cartwright argued that black people had lower lung capacity and therefore were only healthy when forced to be enslaved. So, you know, pinning enslavement on black people's supposed innate difference, we can see that same kind of thinking in the idea that George Floyd was responsible for his own death because of some innate problem that in his body that was triggered by his drug use. A completely bogus idea, completely discredited by reality, but it's that same theme that comes up over and over and over again, which is one of the reasons I think why so much of my work is about this false biological concept, because so much of racial injustice is justified by this basic idea that Black people have in their bodies the defects, you know, the depravities that call for harsh containment and that explain our disadvantage in America. It's such a powerful and persistent way that you, you can see in you know, everything we've talked about to obscure the reality of racism and white supremacy, even the most violent forms of it. You know, so again, let, going back to where we started out with the prosecution of black women for using drugs during pregnancy. You know, in South Carolina, there was a policy that was cooked up by the hospital there, the Medical University of South Carolina, to test black patients for drug use, pregnant black patients for drug use, and then arrest them in right after they gave birth. So women were being handcuffed and shackled and taken out in wheelchairs, still bleeding from delivery and put in the Charleston County Jail. Now that's torture. You know, that is like the most dehumanizing thing. How we're supposed to think of the maternity ward as this, you know, holy ground where, you know, women give birth and it's in white culture, you know, it's seen as this, this sacrosanct place. But for Black women, it could be invaded by police officers and women treated in the most brutal ways. And But how could that happen? Because there was this promotion of the view that these women had a biological defect. Uh, literally, the media said that they were deprived of maternal instinct, you know, that they were passing on these biological defects to their children. And so you could, you got this biological justification for what ordinarily anyone could see was brutal state violence. And Fast forward to George Floyd, where you could see that this man was killing him, you know, on, on camera. It, it was plain. And yet some people could ignore that. They could see that as something that was justified because of this idea of a, a biological disturbance, you know, within George Floyd's body. And so uh, it, it's, a, it's a, such a, a powerful way of hiding the violence of racism. The, the biological concept of race. I mean, that's why I wrote my third book, Fatal Invention, how science, politics, and big business recreate race in the 21st century. And there were people who said, well, oh, that's a strange turn you know, for you. <laughs> You've been writing about Black women, both the violations of Black women's reproductive lives and, and the resistance against it. And then my second book was about racism in the child welfare system and the uh, taking of children 
uh, from black mothers and why that was a form of racial oppression. And then I turned to medicine and genetic science and the biological concept of race, but that is the foundation for a lot of these oppressions. It, 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 it masks them. It's a, it's a powerful way that has lasted for 400 years to mask the violence of white supremacy. Wow, wow. I mean, it's, thank you so much for, for making those connections because one of the questions that I had and, and one of the, our listeners had is, was asking you to talk about kind of the through line in your work. And I think you very much just articulated it. If, there were, if, if you see any others yeah that um, maybe this is two part, are there any other lines that cut through the work and was it all intentional? Like, did you have like this research program set up and you're like, I'm gonna do one about, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so how no. did that all connect? No, well, first of all, I did not have a research program at all. In fact, I have been detoured from the book I would actually like to be writing over and over and over again because of some really, horrendous way that an issue is being viewed that, that I can see is reproducing these racist ideas in, in policies that have a big impact. Um, and yet there's a general misunderstanding of what's really going on in these policies. So um, after I wrote Killing the Black Body, I became aware that there were thousands and thousands of black newborns who were being taken from their mother's arms, ripped from their mother's arms and placed in foster care. And that seemed so shocking to me. I, I knew that there was such a thing as a child, the child welfare system and foster care, but I didn't realize until I was working on killing the black body how many black children were taken from their homes. And again, just like with the prosecutions where I said, well, this can't be to help black children here too. I thought this can't be to help black children. Since when does America have an institution that is disproportionately filled with black people that's good for black people? You know, I, I wanted to, look into how it could be that in Chicago where I was living at the time, virtually all the children in foster care were black. So well, how could you have a, a, you know, basically an apartheid institution going on and there wasn't a huge outcry about it. Um, and so that's why I wrote that book, Shattered Bonds. And then with Fatal Invention, I started seeing these scientific articles reported in the paper that claimed to say that actually race at, was a genetic category and starting to attribute all of these inequities, racial inequities to innate genetic difference. And I, again, I was shocked because since I was, little. I always knew that there was one human race, that race, race was invented. It's, it's not a natural division of human beings. I, I just thought that was a given. So I was shocked that leading peer-reviewed scientific journals were publishing these articles that attributed all sorts of inequities to some innate, again, innate defect in black people's bodies. Uh, and so uh, in each case, it was really that I was alarmed by something that seemed to me to be such a blatant act of state racism, you know, that it, it seemed as if it wasn't getting the attention or being interpreted that way. And in each of these cases, there was an argument being made by policymakers and in the media that each of these institutions 
was for the benefit of black people when I could see plainly that it was harming us, you know, that they, these institutions were designed to control and punish and disrupt black communities. And so that's something that I think is a through line is working on exposing how institutions that are claimed to be beneficial to us are actually ways that the state is attempting to control and disrupt and destroy Black people's bonds with each other and ability to resist oppression. And, and then on top of that, I think another through line is that I, I do focus a lot on the way in which the idea of innate Black inferiority, um, especially a biological inferiority, has been used to uphold all of these institutions. And then the other through line would be the way in which Black women in particular are the subject of these ideas and punitive policies and how they impact us, how we are resisting against them, uh, but also how they hold up these institutions more broadly and why our organizing and resistance is so important to dismantling them and imagining a different kind of society that doesn't rely on these punitive ways of meeting people's needs and keeping people safe and pretending you know, to actually support people when the current way of doing things is punitive and destructive. Absolutely, thank you. And as we make space for, for probably one question, okay. I'm, glad you, I'm glad you named, um, or like one folded into another. Um, when, I'm glad you named resistance um, yeah. because one of the questions teed up um, is in, in the fight for Black people to find basic dignity and care in medicine, but based on Shattered Bond, I'd add in social work and maybe yeah. you know, education. What do you yeah. think are the most effective angles of change um, to, to speak into practitioners changing policies? And, mm -hmm. and as one question asks, and how do we keep our own embodied selves <laughs> kicking in the yeah. process? Right, right. Well, I think that abolition, the, the abolitionist approach and framework and philosophy is critical. Uh, I'm, I'm working now on a new book on abolishing the child welfare system or what I like to call the family policing system because I, I think that it is a system that was designed to oppress black people and there is nothing good about it. it. It's just oppressive through and through. It hurts the children who are taken from their families and put in various forms of substitute care, often for black children, especially teens, it's prison-like conditions. And it destroys black families. There's no way to reform it. I think it's very similar to what prison abolitionists are saying about prisons. It cannot be reformed. And so uh, I would say the same thing about my work in race and medicine, that we need to abolish the notion that medicine should be based on biological concepts of race. That should just be abolished. There are ways in which the biological idea of race is literally embedded in medicine in the sense that it's in the technologies, the diagnostic tools, the algorithms that adjust for race as if uh, categorically and automatically, if the patient is black, it's a different 
result, you know, and I think that should be abolished. There's just, there's certain, certain institutions, ways of thinking that were invented and developed to oppress us. <laughs> there's no way to reform them. They should be dismantled. And at the very same time, and it's just as essential that we work toward a completely different way of approaching people's needs in the child welfare system, approaching families' needs and children's needs, not by brutally separating families that's and putting children in the care of strangers or in facilities. Uh, that obviously is not, and it's not just obviously, it's empirically, you know, not, and just humanly not a, a good way, a safe way, a caring way to approach families' needs and, and ensure safety. And so we need to be working toward a completely different way of doing it. You know, simultaneously, but you can't, you really can't separate them. Again, with the child welfare system, it's so plain that that system needs to be dismantled. But at the very same time, we have to be creating ways to care for children. It, this is not, you know, about just abandoning struggling families on their own in this racist capitalist society we have where people will literally be allowed to starve you know if they don't have the means and so how do we work toward that and i think prison abolitionists have developed some really useful and effective both principles so for example figuring out what are non-reformist reforms to take incremental steps toward abolition, uh, developing mutual aid and other kinds of community-based networks. I, I think all of that I think is very useful in the reproductive justice movement. We have long argued for uh, and developed and implemented self care, you know, the Black Women's Health Project for decades has had a, it's not the Black Women's Health Imperative, but in, originally it was founded in the idea of Black women getting together at in their homes to care for each other. And I think that's the basis of mutual aid as well, thinking about how we can care for each other, support each other, organize together collectively to build human, humane and caring and just and equal forms of making sure everyone has the resources they need and the kind of society that would support our lives in, instead of the kind of society we have now that is so violent and oppressive. So those are some of the things that we can we can do um, to move toward a, a radically different kind of society that doesn't cage people anymore, that doesn't rip children away from their families. Uh, that doesn't treat Black people as if we are some kind of biologically distinct species that is prone to bad outcomes. Uh, all of that should be abolished and we can build a different society that's humane and caring. Thank you for that vision. Thank you for that vision. Wow, I think that is a very inspiring place for us to, I won't say stop, pause, because the work continues. 
Um, thank you so much, so, so, so much um, to Allison uh, for, for so yes, capably moderating and asking such wonderful questions. And thank you thank so you. much, Dorothy, um, for all that you do. And I just want to name to me that that place where we just closed, you know, part of what your work has done is to help us see these threads of punishment criminalization, right? And deferring to carcerality when care is always an option. Thinking yeah. about how we build systems to care for each other and ourselves, that is always on the table. And, and your work yeah. reminds us that it's not about a particular issue, area or topic, that that, that is the thread. And that is that is a thread that that is so moving to me. And, and I'm just really grateful to both of you for this conversation tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you wrapped it up very well. Uh, thank, thank you. you so I was much. listening. I was listening. So before we go, I'm going to do my commercials. Um, if you enjoyed this conversation and you would like a free copy of Fatal Invention, this is a very special day for you because if you sign up for our newsletter at blackfreedomlectures.org slash newsletter, um, you can tell us in two minutes what you thought of this lecture and you can be entered into a drawing to win a free copy of Fatal Invention, which is a book that I return to so often um, and that I highly recommend. So please do check that out. And just a reminder, as I said at the top of our conversation, tomorrow um, on our YouTube channel right here, we will be uh, having a new lecture drop. That will be Barbara Ransby talking about Black internationalism, Marxism, and anti-fascism. Um, it's a back-to-back -back Black feminist doubleheader, really, uh, every, every week, really. Um, and on Monday, we have a very special event with Karee Peterson-Smith, who will be talking to us about Black and Palestinian freedom struggles. That will be a live Q&A Monday, May 17th, 6 p.m., always Central Time, because we are in the city of Wynn, Chicago, Illinois. Um, thank you so much one more time to our guests. So grateful for you, and I hope to see you all around. Please take good